This is a recording for your notes on the evidence of evolution. So, through this short unit, we have already been talking about uh, that there were three people at least that early on uh, realized that organisms do change in, uh, over time. And one was the French person, Mr. Lamarck. Then we had Darwin and Wallace. All right. And we know that of these three, Lamarck did notice that organisms change over time, but uh, his explanation of acquired characteristics was not supported by evidence. However, the mechanism of change over time proposed by Darwin and Wallace based on the principle of natural selection, those are the ones that have shown uh, all the evidence is supported by all the observations and experimental work done. So today we're going to go over what sort of evidence, what kind of uh, data do we have to support this idea that organisms do change over time. So we are going to have here, I have a list of the five topics that we are going to discuss. We have evidence from the fossil record. Comparative anatomy, just comparing the body parts of different organisms. Embryology, how we develop. Molecular evidence, that this is a brand new field since we started being able to sequence DNA and proteins. And finally, evidence that we have from the resistance to pesticides and resistance to antibiotics that many organisms have developed in the last 50, 60 years. So we are going to go one by one on all those. This is kind of the here you have it all kind of review. So we are going to start with the fossil record. So we already discussed a little bit of, about the fossil record. If you were in my room, you already took a look at some of the fossils and basically remember that the fossil record is going to show us basically that some species change. One of the things that they show us is that some species do change over time because through the fossil record you see different species changing very slightly, the same species over time, changing the shape slightly over time. We also know that the fossil records show us that some organisms, again this is the arrow of time, here is the present, we have some organisms that show up in the fossil record, yes, 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 and then all of a sudden they stop and disappear and they are not present today. So that tells us that things have changed over time. And then, of course, we have some species that are very distinctive today in the present that look very, 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 very different from what they were like long time ago. So the fossil record shows us a number of things and provides us evidence and some basically actual things that we can look at over the millions of years that life has been on Earth. Remember that the first organisms are about 3.5 billion years old, billion years old, and this first organism were the prokaryotics, the bacteria that we have today. Okay? Uh, also, the fossils, of course, are going to show us the progression, as I indicated, how organisms change, and also who the ancestors of some present day organisms are. Remember that since we are changing, somebody had to be before us. So those are the things that the fossil record shows us. So here you have a beautiful trilobite, just like the one I have in my room. These organisms live for a very short period of time of about 50 million years. For us, that's an eternity, but this is very short time that they were around on Earth and they were here around 450 million years ago, but they lived for a very short time. You have a fossil of a leaf. I also have some leaf fossils, so even though they don't have bones, they still fossilize and leave imprints on the rocks. And of course, my favorite coprolites, basically poop, 
fecal material that gives you a lot if you break it up and you look inside it tells you a lot of things about what the creatures eat the size of their digestive system and an indication of the type of organism and the sort of things that they ate so a lot of information about the organisms themselves and their behavior sometimes Now re let's remember also that for the fossil record we can put a date on many things you know if you are trying to figure out when things happen put in a date and remember that we have absolute dating that is done using radioactive dating the decomposition of some uh, carbon for very recent things but things like potassium uh, for older things that is in your notes on fossils and we also have the relative dating that is based on the relative position of the organisms on the rocks and remember that things that are more recent are on top and things that are more older older they are near the bottom of the layers just because the sediments accumulate vertically All right now by Comparing every time you find a fossil, if you can determine the age, then you can put together, you can put together a picture of all this and you can see the change. And I challenge you to do this with these scallops. This is the genus, is Chesapecten, and you know our scientific names. If not, we are going to learn it in the next unit. This is the genus Chesapecten. They are scallops, like the ones we eat. This is their shell. They are mollusks. And these are actually fossils from the Chesapeake Bay. These are scallops that we had here. And I challenge you to look at this very carefully and see changes that had happened from down here to more recent. And one of the things that you can look at is these wings they call it wings in the hinge of the scallop they have two two plates and two two shells and they open and close this is the hinge if you notice the shape is very different and is changing the other thing that you might notice is that the number of ridges is changing here there are a lot of small ridges and here you can see that they are wider and fewer ridges so a number of things changing so by being able to determine the age of each one of these you can kind of put them in sequence and you can see the gradual change how they have changed over time all that with just the fossils and finally you have a few more examples of things that they are totally extinct like the trilobites Ammonites, this is a mollusk, similar to a, a squid or an octopus, but they had a shell. So the tentacles came from here, if you know octopus or squid, but they had a shell. And then you have things that are very similar actually to present day fishes, like this fossil is very similar to things that we have today. Same thing with the scallops, very similar to what we still have today. So totally gone, disappear forever, still close relatives of these still present. So those are the kind of things that fossils allow us to figure out, that there were things that don't exist anymore, while others have not changed much. The second line of evidence that we have is based on what we call comparative anatomy by looking at structures uh, comparing in different organisms. And one of the things is what we call homologous. Uh oh, another homo word. This is not homozygous. These are not homologous chromosomes. These are homologous structures. As you know, homo means the same. So homologous structures are structures that have the same origin. They start from the same type of tissue, basically, but as the organisms develop, they might change. So you have the same origin, but different shapes at the end, different functions. Same origin, 
but you are going to end up with a different form or function. If you want to make a diagram to illustrate this, I would do it like this. This is the beginning, same, and then these structures are going to end up looking different, like that. Same origin, and they are going to finally be having different functions. And of course, these different functions are going to be determined again by the environment through natural selection. Even though they start in the same point, they are going to end up looking, looking different. So, why do they look the same or why do we say that they have the same origin? Because a common ancestor is going to have it. So let me explain this to you. Right here there are five pictures of the arms of a human, a cat, a whale and a bat. They are a little bit distorted because they are wider than they should be, but human, cat, whale and bat. And the outline is kind of the outline including the fleshy part. In humans we use it to, as an arm. Cats walk on them, whales use it as flippers to swim, and bats use their arms to fly. This is actually the connection made by the membranes of the wing. Now, if you look inside the bow, inside any of these structures, you're gonna see that the bones are exactly, exactly the same. This bone here is the same as that one, as that one, and as that one, and is the humerus. You don't need to remember the names, but it's the one appearing in your arm. Then these two bones here that you have here are the ulna and the radius, that is the two bones that you have in the arm here. And you have it there, you have it there, you have it there, and you have it there. Then you have the carpals that are all the bones that you have here, that they are all crowded right there, right there, right there, and right there. And then you have all the finger bones that are here, that are the browns, the browns, and the browns. So notice exactly the same bones in the same places, the only difference is that some are longer, wider, shorter, stubbier, but it's the same. So that tells you that this, all these organisms had a common ancestor. They all descend from a common ancestor, one organism, and as these organisms adapted, were selected for to live in different environments, the best shape of arm was selected over and over and over again, over 300, 400 million years, until you end up with these different forms that fulfill different functions. Grabbing and being functional, cat, walking, jumping, swimming, and flying. So same origin, our ancestor had all the same, but now, they all fulfill a different function, they look different because they have been adaptations to different environments. I have the same thing here in more detail and you can see the names there. Here is a pterodactyl, that's a dinosaur, one of the flying dinosaurs, a bird and a bat. You can see again the same colors represent the same bones. We have exactly the same bones. A dolphin and a seal Again, you can compare these bones vertically or across. We all have the same bones. Flying, swimming, running, or grasping. The only difference is how long or how short, how fat or skinny each one of these bones are. So these homologous structures that have the same origin but then change still maintaining a common pattern, these are strong evidence that all these vertebrates descend, with some modifications of course, from a common ancestor. And who is this common ancestor to all these vertebrates? Because all the vertebrates have all the same bones. This common ancestor 
is what we call a loved finned fish. This is the fin of a fish. It's not skinny and flat like the fins of present day fishes. They were more chunky. And if you look inside, and we see this in fossils of these fishes, and also there are some of these that are still alive, very similar. And if you look inside, very tiny, you still see exactly the same bones connected in the same pattern. So, these are homologous structures. Homo means the same, indicating same origin, but then different function. This kind of pattern is evidence that organisms have changed, but also this is what we call is a typical example of divergent evolution. Remember divergent lines are lines that separate. This is from geometry. These are divergent. Here is your common ancestor, right here, and divergent evolution going in different patterns. And of course, what drives this change is again our environment. All right? So homologous structures. We love when we find homologous structures because we can immediately recognize which species are related to each other. To confuse life, when you know you always have something that throws you a curve there, we have also what we call analogous structures. And we do not like analogous structures for evolution. We don't, they are not of any use for us. What are analogous structures? You have to be able to recognize them. These are structures that have totally different origin. Right here and right here. Totally different origin. I should make a different shape. Let's make it like this. Different origin. Totally different. But over time, they end up looking the same. Over time, due to environmental forces, the environment makes them look exactly the same. So what is a good example of that? If you compare the bird, the wing of a bird or a bat with the wing of an insect. Sorry, it got cut off here. The wings of insects. Insects also fly but they have a totally different structure. They don't have bones. They are totally unrelated. So all the wings or all the bones of vertebrates are homologous, homologous, same origin, same structure. But if you compare the wings of a bird to the wings of an insect, that's not homologous. Those are analogous because they have a different origin, but then they start looking the same. They are both used to fly. They are both wings, all right? And again, what determines that is selection by the environment, because these two types of organisms conquer the air as a way of life. So you want homologous, but you don't want analogous. Analogous do not tell you much about the organisms. Analogous tell you much about the environment, but not about the origin or the connections between the organisms. Then we have the vestigial structures. These are sometimes the favorites. Vestigial structures are structures that our ancestors had, but for us now, given the current conditions, they are not used today. But because they are kind of neutral, like you don't use them or whatever, they are kind of disappearing or they are non-functional. But they are evidence that we are related to our ancestors. So, natural selection is going to eliminate things that you don't necessarily use. Because remember, if you are not selected for, it's like, what do you need that for kind of thing? So if 
something is not gonna be a good adaptation is kind of either not selected or ignored. So those structures usually kind of regress or are forgotten. So let me give you some examples here and will make more sense. The pelvis and the back legs of snakes and whales. Snakes, you know, don't have any, any legs and whales only kept their front ones that are flippers to swim. Whales do not have back flippers. All right, so if you look at this diagram, this is a picture of a snake skeleton and uh, you have your vertebra, you have the ribs here and here you find something funny. This big bone that you have here with these bones that are on the side that end up in a claw here, these are actually the pelvic bone, our pelvis, the femur, that is the long bone of your leg, your upper leg, and here is the bottom of the leg with a little claw. So this is the equivalent of our pelvis and legs. However, they are so reduced that they do not protrude through the skin. But if you open the snakes and you look through the flesh, and you are gonna find this in many species of snakes. So, why do they have this? Because the ancestor of the snakes that were other reptiles did have legs that slowly, because of the type of environment that they were living in, legs were not very useful, it was more useful to slither through and so the legs kept on going, getting unused and not selected for and there you have it. So basically snakes with smaller legs kept being selected, smaller legs keep being selected, smaller legs being selected for until after several millions of years the leg got so small because always the smaller legs allow you to slither better, we end up with present day, the only thing left are some internal bones that show some evidence that there were some legs, but they were not selected for again. Same thing happens with our whales. In whales, but you have the tail, that is the tail tail, the end of the backbone. This is the arm right here, that's the flipper with which they swim, that we just saw some bones there. But right here in the area where the pelvis should be, this is a bigger drawing of it, you have a couple of bones, very small, that are embedded in the blubber, in the fat of the fat tissue of the whale. And one bone is the pelvis and the other one is the femur. The pelvis is basically your hip and the femur is the long bone of your upper leg. So again, this tells you that the ancestor of this had back legs. And over time, if you are gonna be living in the ocean, it's better not to have legs because you are more hydrodynamic. So selection for shorter legs, shorter legs, shorter legs, led to the pretty much the full disappearance of the legs. For the record, if you have no idea, do you know who the who are the closest relatives of whales? Hippopotamus, hippopotamus, hippos. They are the closest relatives of whales. And if you think of a hippo, it's a big chunky animal with short stubby legs that spend most of their time actually in the water and they love to be in the water. Those are your whales' closest relatives. Then we have embryological development. What the embryo looks like. And what we have found out by studying the embryos of many, mostly vertebrates, to be honest, is that the early stages of the embryos, they all look very similar. It's kind of scary. And all of them, 
all of the embryos have what we call gill slits. You know, fishes have gills and they have a little opening so they can get their water in. All of the embryos have gill slits and a tail, including humans. Including humans. All right? So, here you have a fish, a chicken, a pig, and a human. They all have the tail. Even we notice this is a human embryo very early in development. There is the tail. And here, these lines are the openings. They are actually like, um, if you see a fish, the fish has one opening here, that's the eye. Early on, there are several openings, several little openings, kind of like sharks. If you have seen sharks, sharks, they look just like that. Those are called gill slits. And early on in development, even we humans, we have them right here in our neck. In our neck is where you have them. And as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, Every once in a while, there are humans born that have like little leftovers that have not been closed completely in the skin. There are like small openings that of course heal very fast after birth, but there are still a few humans every once in a while that are born with those gill slits. So all vertebrates, early on development. So, embryological evidence that we have a common ancestor. Fish, salamander, turtle, chicken, pig, cow, rabbit, and humans. Early stages. This is very early in development. Look at them. These are drawings. All of them very similar. This is kind of halfway through development. And here is kind of when you become a fetus, that you become a recognizable organism. Please notice the differences, that only when you get to the fetus stage more advanced, you start becoming more differentiated. But very early on, we all have those tails and those gill slits that are characteristic of all vertebrates of all vertebrates. Molecular evidence. We just finished our DNA unit and a couple of things that you learn is that the codon chart, the messenger RNA codons, they all code for the same amino acid, no matter what organism you are looking at. So my codon from humans to the codon used by bacteria, they all code for the same amino acids. So AUG, for example, that messenger RNA, they all code for methionine. And that is everywhere, every single organism. So all those codons in the codon chart, no matter which organism, are the same. So that's why we call it the universal genetic code. So if you think about it, if we were all created kind of independently, we would all have different codes. But that all life, including the lowly, lowly bacteria, that we use the same code, that's evidence that we all come from the same ancestor. Now, what do we use for molecular evidence to see how related we are to each other, to see how we have changed? We use two things. We can use DNA sequences or we can use the amino acid sequence in the proteins. So either amino acids in proteins or the se sequence of nucleotides in DNA. So A, T, C, Gs. All right? Now, what do we learn by comparing the sequences? And you will have an activity in class to do this. Well, if you have similar sequences, that means that you are more closely related. 
similar sequences of amino acids of DNA, that means that you are more closely related. If the dif this, you have more differences between two organisms, that means that you are more distantly related. And I'll explain that shortly. Sequence of nucleotides in the DNA. So that's one thing that we are going to use. The sequence of nucleotides in the DNA or the sequence of amino acids in proteins. Which one do you think it will show more differences? If I pick organism A and organism B and I compare DNA and I compare proteins, which one do you think they are going to show more differences? The differences in nucleotides or amino acids? You are going to see more differences if you use DNA. Why? Why? Some of you are thinking already. The DNA is always going to show us more difference than the changes in amino acids because remember that multiple codons can code for the same amino acid. Remember that multiple codons, multiple codons can code for the same amino acid. Remember that. For example, for example, Ugh, glare. I have here your chart. If I go G U U G U U Valin G U C Ha is a different sequence, but I still get the same amino acid. G U G different sequence, but I still get the same amino acid. So you are always going to see more changes if you use DNA than protein, but it's still useful to do both. Okay? The more similar the sequences, the more closely related, that means that they separated recently, not too long ago. So just to show you a good example of this, and I'll make you a nice diagram in a minute. Here you have amino acid sequence. I know you're not going to be able to read this very carefully because it's very small. This is the amino acid sequence. So we're looking at amino acids of a protein called cytochrome, cytochrome C. This protein is found in the mitochondria and is very important for aerobic cellular respiration. All right, super, super important. It's found in the mitochondria. Remember your cellular respiration. So pretty much every eukaryotic cells, every eukaryotic cell that has mitochondria is going to have cytochrome. All right. Now, green, if you look inside, there are little letters. These are the abbreviations for the amino acids. If they are green, that means here we are comparing, sorry, here we are comparing all these animals to humans. We are comparing all these organisms to humans, to humans, us. So we are comparing all to humans. Right here, you have the number of amino acids that are different between humans and each one of these organisms. If the color is green, that means that there are no differences. If the color is red, that means that there is a difference. So, humans and chimpanzees, all green, there are zero differences in the cytochromes between humans and chimpanzees. Zero in the amino acid sequence. Rhesus monkeys is a different type of uh, chimpanzee. Notice you have one difference. This is a different type of primate, a different type of monkey. One difference right there. 
Then we start getting some not so close relatives of us, like the whale. It's still a mammal, but not as closely related to us. And you can see that between humans and the whales, we have 10 amino acid differences in cytochrome C. A turtle, you know turtles are reptiles, they are not even mammals like us. And then we have 15 differences in the amino acid, in the amino acid sequence. Bullfrogs. Bullfrogs are amphibians. And there we have 18 differences. Tuna fish. Would you eat tuna? Probably. With tuna fish, we have 21 differences. And with the lamprey, that is another type of fish, we have 20 differences. So notice that things that are relatively closer to us, like other mammals, you know, all mammals have certain traits in common, like mammary glands and hair. All mammals, we are relatively close, but then when you are comparing us with reptiles or amphibians or fishes, you start seeing a bigger difference. So that is an indication of who are our closest relatives and who are more distantly related to us. If you have never done this, I would like you to write the sequence, how organisms evolve on land or how we came to be, the vertebrates. Fishes were the first ones. Then came amphibians. This is how we evolve and this is what the fossil record show us who came first, who came next, and so forth. Then came the reptiles, especially the age of the dinosaurs. They were all reptiles. And from the reptiles, the reptiles gave origin to both birds and mammals. Birds and mammals. We are all descendants of reptiles. Okay? So that, again, we use this as an indication of how we are related to each other. Finally, to finish it up, I know this is long, but this is all super cool, according to me. Uh, the other piece of evidence is things that we see right now, looking at antibiotic resistance and uh, pesticide resistance. Everything that we use to kill pests, especially insects that are uh, not good for crops or for humans, like mosquitoes. Now, these changes over time, these evolutionary changes, can happen very fast. And one thing that you have to take into account is how fast an organism reproduces. Because remember that reproduction, your offspring, is actually the one that is surviving and changing. So, if you are an organism that reproduces fast enough, we call that a short generation time, we might be able to see changes very, very fast. For example, bacteria. Bacteria. Bacteria reproduce, or some bacteria can reproduce every 20 minutes. Every 20 minutes, you have a new generation. Imagine how fast those changes are being passed on. Every 20 minutes, you have a new generation. Do you know what's the generation time for humans? It's basically the time at which you are sexually mature and on average, most humans reproduce. Right now, the generation time for humans is between 20 and 25 years. 20 to 25 years. So your parents should be about 20 to 25 years older than you, and your grandparents should be 40 to 50 years older than you. Do the math and figure out. So another creature with a short generation time are mosquitoes, a couple of weeks, and you have a new generation. And because of the increased use of DDT, a pesticide, and all the antibiotics, what we have been doing is killing all the susceptible individuals 
and allowing those that have a enough variation that can survive, survive. And those are the ones that reproduce. So it's important that you understand this. And remember, the antibiotic is not what causes the change. The change was already there in the genes. The antibiotic was did was just kill all the ones that did not have what it took to survive. So remember that the antibiotics are going to kill most, but just leave one bacteria allowed or a few, and those are going to be resistant. These resistants are the ones that are going to reproduce. And remember, in bacteria, you can reproduce every 20 minutes about. And then, of course, these that are resistant, reproduce, divide, and those become the more common. So next time that you use antibiotics, the bacteria are not affected and physicians, doctors need to keep on finding new antibiotics and pharmaceutical companies need to keep on producing new antibiotics that are actually the new ones are very, very expensive. You probably have heard of MRSA. MRSA. That is called, what does MRSA? Sometimes they call it the flesh eating disease. MRSA is methicillin, methicillin, you don't need to write this, resistant, resistant, streptococcus, streptococcus aureus, or, uh, uh, there you go. Streptococcus aureus. Methicillin is one of the most powerful antibiotics that we have. And the acronym MRSA to describe this terrible bacteria that cannot be killed really means these are Streptococcus aureus bacteria that are resistant to this antibiotic. Also notice most antibiotics end in the word IN, ampicillin, penicillin, tetracycline, etc. etc. Good patterns to notice. So, bacteria, and we are seeing this because bacteria uh, divide so fast, we are seeing this in our lifetime. And please remember that antibiotics didn't come to be popular until second. World War Second, so 1940s, 1950s, that's when they became popular and used in the population. So the antibiotics have been around for about 70 years. Finally, I want to just show you what happens here. This is an agar plate. I hope we can, I can get to give you some uh, in a couple of weeks. In all this, we put in this plate here, in this side, this is an agar plate with ampicillin. So they have a special medium there with ampicillin. This is an antibiotic. Antibiotics kill bacteria. And in this plate, we put bacteria. Here is totally clean. That means bacteria cannot grow. That means the antibiotic is killing the bacteria. Here, you see these opaque things. These are bacteria that are able to grow here despite the presence of the antibiotic. So you know that these bacteria are resistant to this antibiotic. I have the same situation here using a different antibiotic called canamycin, also a very new, strong antibiotic. And if you are susceptible, the bacteria are going to die. If the bacteria are susceptible, they are going to die. But if they are resistant, you can see them, those opaque things, those are a lot of colonies of bacteria. This is very similar to what you get in your teeth in the morning before you brush. If you scrape your teeth in your fingernails, you are going to see a white paste. Those are all the bacteria that are growing in your teeth overnight and that's why it looks exactly the same as this, a white paste. 
And with that happy thought, I want to finish and just round up the ideas that again we have a lot of evidence that organisms change over time and we have used five different things and we finish it up, finished up with pesticides and antibiotics that are things that we are seeing in our lifetime without having to use things that existed long ago. I hope this helps. Thank you for listening and I will see you in class.